Uh, my name is Shauli, and I'm the CEO of Armo, and we're going to discuss what we've learned from scanning over 10,000 Kubernetes clusters uh, using a Cubescape. Cubescape is an open source tool that we have created. I'm going to talk more about it as we go forward. Just a little, little, a little bit about myself. As I said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Armo. Um, I'm a software developer turned into entrepreneur. Uh, in my uh, life before that, I'm a software engineer, worked in a few companies, and I'm a very big fan of surfing, and you see me there uh, on one of the waves there. Um, and this picture was taken pretty much five seconds before I completely fell on my face. Um, so it looks good, but the reality was much, much different, as we always have with reality versus pictures, right? So um, you seem to be the audience that I don't need to convince that Kubernetes is here to stay and is becoming the de facto cloud native operating system for everything related to containers and managing containers. Um, but the numbers shows that 96% uh, of organizations are either already using or are evaluating the usage of Kubernetes and over 5.6 million developers are using Kubernetes worldwide. Um, and that 31% of all uh, backend developers and it's increasingly being used in production. And this is a very big uh, change that has happened in 2021. Um, if, you, if you think about what happened until 2021, Kubernetes was all over development environments. Everyone was experimenting with it, but it moved into production workloads and into production environments during late 2019, early uh, 2021. And that's also where it got off the radar for attackers and for researchers um, if you think about what happened in 2021, there were so many vulnerabilities that were found in containers, container runtime, and Linux that impact your ability to run Kubernetes safely. And this is just because it became more popular. It became more popular, people uh, experimented with it more. Honestly, we don't know about many breaches that happened on Kubernetes, but a lot of research into vulnerabilities has gone into it, and usually that happens right before uh, the first attack happens. So, this is still uh, yet to be seen. Um, and, I, and, you know, we feel at least that Kubernetes security solutions, um, they fail to provide a DevOps experience or developer experience. I guess many of you here are not CISOs. You are developers or you are DevOps uh, engineers. And what I want to tell you guys is security is coming your way. Um, security is shifting left. I can tell you when I speak with a CISO, and I'll tell them, um, I have a Kubernetes security solution to propose to you. The first reaction is, okay, I need to get my DevOps involved because they don't know nothing about Kubernetes. They just see a mess. They just see a lot of, um, you know, things going around and they don't understand what's going on. And, and what we see is a big shift in the market towards developers and DevOps owning and engineering thing, teams owning security. And that's why we've created Cubescape. Um, this is more data. I don't want to dwell too much on it because we only have 30 minutes. But basically, um, some of the data here that, you know, people are releasing uh, release cycles weekly. 26% of the people uh, responded to this uh, Red Hat survey uh, um, do a release cycle of, of, of a weekly. And only 7% are quarterly. This is a very big change from a long time ago. But to go to what um, I just talked, spoke with you about, what role is your organization is most responsible for containers and Kubernetes security. And 27 people, so 27% of organizations put DevOps uh, or Ops uh, into uh, the, um, the, the answer there. And there is also DevSecOps, right? 18% DevSecOps. We'll talk about this function because it's a new function and I don't really know, honestly, what is the difference between DevSecOps and DevOps and how they work together. And we can talk about that. In terms of what is concerning, Companies and, and, and engineers around security for Kubernetes is, first of all, misconfigurations. 60% uh, worry about misconfigurations. And 32% uh, after that um, are worried about security incident happening in runtime. Um, Gartner thinks that by 2025, 99% of cloud breaches will have a root cause of a misconfiguration. And I don't think that's, um, you know, it might be extreme, but it's not imaginary. Because just think, if you're using Kubernetes uh, or you're using cloud, just think about the amount of configurations that are going on and the, and the misconfigurations that can, that can happen in all of the different YAMLs uh, that you basically dump into your cluster and many people don't know what's going on there. So what we did, we developed Cubescape 
Um, Cubescape um, has already scanned over 15K clusters. We did an analysis on the first 10 that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's, it's on GitHub. It's a completely open source. We have a SaaS version that we, of course, encourage you to use. Uh, but the project is open source, and we're going to actually increase the open source part of it uh, going forward. It already has close to 6,000 stars on GitHub, um, quite a few contributors, and we're trying to expand. So, you know, you're welcome also to contribute. And, I'm gonna, and everything I'm going to show you today is an output uh, of Cubescape. Basically, what it does, you download it, you point it in a cluster, and you get a risk scan of that cluster, both for vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. Um, this is the main functionality that you get, um, risk analysis and compliance, basically comparing the status of your cluster against different best practices. Uh, the most um, prolific one that we've seen, the most interesting one that we've seen, is the NSA and CISA guidance. Uh, the NSA issued guidance into how you should work with the Kubernetes security environment. We basically took that document and made it into a framework that you could get pass fail on every test on that framework. Um, we added image scanning because many of our uh, participants asked to connect the misconfiguration to actual vulnerabilities. Uh, of course, if you have a misconfiguration on, on a, a vulnerable um, workload versus non-vulnerable workload, it's, it, it makes a difference. And finally, RBAC Visualizer. RBAC is the latest thing that we added, which basically maps all the role-based access control that you have in your Kubernetes environment into something that you can digest, that you can see. Because basically, try you know ask yourself, what are the different roles and, and, and uh, permissions that I have uh, in my role-based access control? What you're going to need to take is a ton of different YAMLs and uh, role bindings and, 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 and role and privileges and combine it together. So we did it for you. So that's what we did. And uh, we put it all in a single pane of glass that you can see it um, in a very uh, useful manner. So what does the research show? So we have scanned... Uh, over 10,000, uh, not we, our users, scanned over 10,000 different clusters. 48% um, of our users are coming from the North American region. Um, about 33% are from Europe and the rest are uh, from the EMEA and APAC. 57% uh, of the users who have ran Cubescape. Um, the title that they provided uh, was uh, DevOps. And 24% were security engineers or architects. Um, everyone using Cubescape is an ends on guy, okay? No CISO or even not a security analyst is going to run Cubescape because it needs, it, to, it needs an understanding of the environment and it needs the developer capabilities. Um, we talked before about um, uh, DevSecOps. We have 5% DevSecOps. And in my mind, this is just an indication that the title DevSecOps is just not used enough. Okay, because in my mind, those 57% DevOps people who ran Cubescape why did they do that? It was because they were interested and they were concerned about the security of their environment. So in my mind, they're already DevSecOps in some of what they do, right? So it's kind of like, in my mind, uh, the title thing is going to change um, a little bit soon. Uh, in terms of uh, an environment, how many clusters and how many uh, um, nodes within a cluster uh, do, you, do people use? So we see that the 42% of the users have one cluster. I'd call those people who experiment with us. Uh, about 2 to 33% have, have um, less than four clusters. And only 3% have 25 clusters and more. If you're an organization and you have more than 25 clusters, um, I, I, you have my full empathy. It's a very <laughs> problematic situation uh, to be in. And <laughs> or, or a very good one, I don't know. Uh, in terms of cluster size, uh, most of the clusters uh, have below 10, uh, 10 uh, worker nodes, and about 6% of the clusters of the 10,000 clusters had more than 50 nodes. This is something that we see more and more. And there is always, always, always a debate whether to use many small clusters or one large cluster. Okay? Um, I'm a one large or, or a few large clusters kind of guy, okay? Um, because I think the control plane of Kubernetes by itself is so complicated and, uh, and, and also heavy in terms of uh, uh, resources that it requires that uh, I would like to limit the number of control planes that I have. Uh, however, if you do use one cluster, what we've seen is you should use many namespaces um, because we've seen one namespace with a thousand uh, pods usually doesn't work very well in terms of complexity. So how do you do that? Uh, it takes three minutes to get your first scan. I'm going to show you how to do that. And 
Megan actually encouraged me to do that. So I'm going to show you how to do that uh, right now um, on the spot, just so uh, you see how it goes. Usually uh, we start with um, the GitHub page. Uh, our users go to the GitHub page and there is an installation instruction here. Um, you basically take the install script um, and we pipe it into binbash. I know some people don't like piping into binbash. What, what, I'm, what, what am I running? But it's open source, so you can look what you're running. Um, I'm going to copy it here, and I have a, GC, uh, a GKE account that is here. Okay, if I do um, cube control get pods, I have something running here. Huh? Okay, maybe it doesn't like that. Yeah, space. Okay, um, and now I'm going to paste the uh, command I just copied, and I'm going to run it. Basically, it downloads Cubescape and installs it as a CLI right here on my machine. And since my machine is pointed uh, with its uh, cube config into this cluster, if I run Cubescape now, it will run it against that cluster. So I'm going to run Cubescape. Cubescape. Uh, scan. Framework. I'm going to do the NSA framework. And I'm going to run. Up. Yes, because no one uses capital letters these days. Okay. Now it's accessing, and this is the result. So we get all of the different um, controls that have been created uh, for the NSA uh, framework, and we get a pass fail and the number of resources that failed each. Uh, I could use the verbis mode, and then it will give me for each control exactly which resources fail that control. And it also gets me into the UI, um, where you can register to our SaaS, and then you, you basically get the same results with a little bit more functionality, but you get it uh, in a more organized way. It will get you basically uh, here, where you can see that I have the NSA framework, and I have all of the different requirements, uh, controls, and what passed and what failed uh, for each one of those controls. So that's it. I think we spent about three minutes on, on getting the results and seeing uh, it in action. Uh, as I said, we have, about, uh, we have about five different frameworks to work with, uh, but there are four that are most popular. There is the NSA framework. There is the Mitre attack framework that was uh, adjusted to Kubernetes actually by Microsoft. There is the Armor Best Practices framework, which we have created. Basically, what we did there is we took from Mitre and from NSA the top uh, priority and, and the most important ones that we felt uh, are important. And there is the DevOps best practices, which basically adds on top of security some regular best practices. So, for example, you know, using... Um, a probe, using a liveliness, a liveliness probe in every microservice, right? It's a very good best practice. It's not really related to security, but you might want to know uh, which workloads in your environment don't have, the, have one. Uh, so readiness probe, liveliness probe, those type of things are in the be in DevOps best. Now, what we've seen, we give you a score. We give your cluster a score. Uh, the higher the score, the worse you are in terms of your uh, situation. Um, uh, it's a risk score. And our best practice is what you've seen based um, on, on the data is that you should keep your score below 30. If you're below 30, you're in a relatively good position. If you have a risk score above 60, okay, uh, you are in the worst 5% uh, of the 10,000 clusters of, of our uh, sample size. If you have a risk score below uh, 10, you are at the top 10%. Okay? So that's kind of like to give you a benchmark of uh, what you should look for. And if I go back here, uh, you can see the, score, the scores right here, and you can choose uh, which ones you want to see and which ones you don't want to see. In terms of the top five security misconfigurations that we have found. So first of all, before we go to the actual top five, 100% of clusters had a misconfiguration in them. Now this, uh, while this is alarming, it's not as alarming as it sounds because, you know, some misconfigurations or, or things that the system would consider as misconfigurations are actually intended, right? So if, for example, um, running a privileged workload, right? Um, it's a very bad practice, but some workloads need to run as privileged. Um, so it's not surprising. And I would say that if you need to think about actual misconfiguration, probably 70% uh, 
of clusters had one or two, more than one of those. Uh, 65% of clusters had high severity misconfigurations and 50% of clusters, that's the, the cutoff point, uh, if you look at half of the clusters, had 14 or more uh, misconfigurations. Now the top misconfigurations are running privileged containers, uh, using cluster admin binding, missing resources policies, basically limits on resources, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, um, immutable container file system, very, very popular, um, basically not using immutable container file system, and not uh, a blocking ingress and uh, egress on, on a pod uh, with, with some kind of policy. So those are the top. Um, and stop running privileged workloads, that's the first one that I would say. Um, and when we talk about privileges, there are two ways to get privileges. Um, and one is using um, just the, um, um, the, the, the metadata privilege true, okay? If you use privilege true in your container uh, YAML, you basically cancel the, the notion of container, okay? You give anyone in that container access to the entire host, you basically break out of the namespace. Um, and the other thing you can do is another something you shouldn't do is to run the user within the container as a, as a user less than 1000, which is a, a root user or user zero. Um, so we recommend running as user uh, 1000 and more. Are you familiar with that? It makes sense. And um, now the difference is that if you do that one on, the, on your right, basically you me it means that you're running a root process within the container, but if privilege is false, that root user will not be able to go outside the container. It's root only within the container. If you give it privileges, it also can go outside of the container. So using privilege uh, false is a very good best practice to start with, but then also removing root is the second one. Now, here's a pop quiz for you guys. Um, if you do run as user zero and the privilege is false, it's quite of easy. It's it's easy to understand the 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 outcome. The outcome is the root process that is in the container, but it doesn't have capabilities outside of the container. What happens if you run as a user, not as a root user, but you give it privilege true? So technically, a non-root user could be going outside of the container, or couldn't it? Do you need to be root in order to actually utilize the privilege that you've been given, or not? And the answer is that I'm not going to answer that. Uh, what I'm going to do is anyone here or, or anyone in the streaming who sends me an email or a tweet or whatever with some information of that or the answer to what's happened in this situation, uh, we'll give you 100 points to our swag store. Okay? We have a very cool swag store that you can use to buy hats and bags and water bottles or anything like that. Um, or a t-shirt, whatever you want. So shoot us an email and, or, or LinkedIn or whatever, Twitter, and uh, you'll get that. Privilege, the problem with privilege container has made all of the vulnerabilities that were found in uh, 2021 extreme. So basically, if you just did that, if you just stopped using root users and privilege containers, 90% of the vulnerabilities that have been found in 2021 would not be exploitable in your system. They, were, they required those privileges in order to be exploitable. And this is just an example, the 04921, uh, privilege escalation and container escape. 63% um, of users um, have used workloads that were exposed outside of the cluster without uh, ingress uh, control. This is, of course, very problematic, a workload that is completely open to the internet. And here you have the YAML and how to, uh, to change that. You basically need to add the block element. By the way, if you go to our system, um, not only our system, our docs are available for everyone. I'm just going to want to show you something here. This is off script. But for every one of our controls, um, let's say, you know, privilege container, for example, we have uh, a document documentation that explains to you exactly what it means, uh, what the remediation is, and how to, to solve it with an example. And this um, URL, hub.armor.cloud, uh, is available for anyone. So it, you don't have to log into our SAS in order to get that. Uh, you can get that directly. Limit uh, re resources. 63% of clusters did not run with a proper uh, memory and CPU uh, request and limits configuration. 
very, very good practice, not only for security, but also for, you know, finance, FinOps, resource utilization in your organization. It is very important to do that. What we recommend, actually, you can uh, even in- integrate Cubescape into your GitHub. You can, you, we have like a GitHub, um, Git action uh, extension. And this is really nice because you can say, for example, uh, every YAML or every configuration that is pushed into this Git repository, run this test and tell the user, tell the developer, the actual developer, that it did not put uh, limit resources and they can do it right there. So um, that's uh, one thing uh, that you can do. Um, the way, you, just to show you how it looks like. So if you go back here, let's take this um, um, privilege container as an example. If I click on that, I can see that I have different workloads that are running as privileged. You can see that, uh, I don't know if you saw the number here, it shows one. Okay, even though, even though if I look at things, I can see that there are more than one. There is like the uh, PDCSI node and all, all kinds of others, but those are all in the cube system. And unfortunately, those need to run as privilege. If you take the privilege away, you will mess up your cluster. So they are, they are marked as an exception here, just so we won't alert on them. Okay, uh, you can decide that you want to get those alerts, but it's usually just a rubbish. Um, and then there is this deployment in the default namespace called recommendation service. And if I go into that, I can see uh, that it does not have the proper resources. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a privileged container. So I can see privileged container is failed and it says line 69. It gets me to line 69 and I can see exactly that privilege is true. Uh, I can have, uh, there's a little note here about how to fix it and you can copy the object and download the YAML in order to push it back to your CICD in a fixed manner. 37%. Which is, you know, it's not 60%, but it's still very problematic for this specific problem. 37% had cluster and applications with credentials in the configurations files. Think about access key to AWS, access key to S3 in the actual configuration file of the workloads. Uh, of course, very, very problematic, um, but actually um, very understandable. You know, if I'm a developer, you know, it's the, the, the easiest place to, to be. Of course, better to use the Kubernetes secrets or, or something like that. Again, if you look at uh, the way uh, we show it to you, just to kind of like show you where we came from, um, very, very similar to what I just showed you. Uh, let's look at application credentials. Here you go, application credentials in configuration file. So we have here another service. And if you go to line 34, we can see that there was an AWS secret access key in uh, this configuration file. Now we do not take the key out, right? Uh, we don't want to ke- take uh, users' private data or, or, or secret data. So we kind of like put those, um, we obfuscate it, uh, but you know that this is where you have that, that problem. If you want to send this to us, um, we will allow to you, but on default, we don't take it because we don't want uh, to expose you to that risk. And then I think finally, yes, finally, the last one of the top five is uh, running with dangerous Linux capabilities. This is for me a subset of the privilege and run as root uh, type capabilities. Uh, we, d- we define two different capabilities. We define dangerous capabilities and uh, insecure capabilities. In our mind, like just in terms of our terminology, insecure is worse uh, than dangerous. And this is the list of um, capabilities that we check for. And, um, and this is, uh, and the ones that are in red are ones that we consider uh, even uh, more problematic. Of course, the net admin, sysadmin, uh, those type of capabilities. That makes sense? Any questions there so far? Cool. Up until now, we talked solely about misconfigurations. Now we are connecting that to vulnerabilities, okay? Uh, we scan the images running in the clusters uh, for vulnerabilities. And what we've seen uh, is that 44% um, uh, of the vulnerabilities were medium to low, but 21% were critical and 35% uh, were high. Uh, And the number of critical vulnerabilities uh, in the clusters, um, 64% of clusters had no critical vulnerabilities, okay? And 17% of clusters had one or two, 13% of clusters had two to five, and 6% had over six, uh, critical vulnerabilities. Um, if you look at that, if you don't consider the, 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 the extent of the vulnerability, just vulnerability in general, 
63% of containers had at least one or more vulnerabilities, and 46% uh, had uh, one or more critical vulnerabilities. This is what I just showed you. Um, and 53% of those containers had RCE vulnerabilities. So we look further into uh, the vulnerability, and if it's an RCE remote code execution vulnerability, uh, we give it a deep, we, we know that it is a remote uh, code execution vulnerability. We believe that's a bigger problem, right? Because by definition, it can be exploited remotely without access to your node. Uh, you can see it here. If you go to image scanning, so you see that, for example, in this environment, these are more, this is more than one cluster. We have 85 critical vulnerabilities, 230 high vulnerabilities. This is, of course, a very bad environment. Uh, but if I filter it, I can see that 27 of the uh, critical vulnerabilities are also remote uh, code execution type vulnerabilities, very problematic. And I can also decide to see which one have fixes. So 45 of the 85 actually have fixes. You should probably go uh, and fix those. Now, if you look at the top five vulnerabilities found, I, I don't have the names here on purpose, and I'll show it in a minute. Unfortunately, to be very, very honest, it doesn't give you a lot of insight. And why is that? Because it is not really the vulnerability as much as it is the library that it is in. Uh, glibc is, of course, one, you know, it's the library that is used in any of your workloads. So any vulnerability in that uh, uh, library will be all across all of your workloads. And that's why you see all of those. The one that was kind of surprising is the uh, libpcre. Do you know what it is? It's a regular expression. Um, a Perl regular expression uh, analyzer that enables you to give Perl uh, uh, type exception into Linux, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I was surprised to see it there, um, but it was there. Um, to kind of like bring those everything together, vulnerabilities will always be out there, okay? Um, but as I said before, and I know we're uh, at the end of, uh, of our talk, and that's what I wanted to speak with you about and to leave you with is being and having the right configuration will make you unexploitable but many of the, by many of the vulnerabilities that, I, that are out there. Whenever a vulnerability comes out, this is, for example, uh, the, four, uh, uh, the 0492 was, it made tons of noise, okay? Tons of noise uh, because it was uh, very easy to exploit. But if you did what, uh, if you looked at the control, control number uh, 16, uh, allow privilege escalation, and you denied running as root, and you did not have insecure capabilities, cap, duck, uh, override, um, you will not be, it will not be able to be exploited. So every vulnerability requires you to have different misconfigurations, or I would say loose configurations in your system. And each one of those, just one of those not being able, would be, uh, would solve this problem. Okay? So that's what I want to leave you with. Um, and, you know, we have, I don't know if I'm allowed, but we also have a booth here at KubeCon, and I would welcome you uh, to come, uh, you know, and get t-shirt and stuff and, and talk more with us. Um, and we would love to engage with you and get your feedback. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Are there any questions? Yes. So which tool are you using to analyze the containers? Like, for example, Aqua System using Trivi, things mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. So the, the, the tool that is used to scan for misconfiguration is, is our tool. It's open source and you can use it. It, it uses OPA, uh, the open policy agent as part of it. And the reason we wanted to do that is we wanted the community to be able to add more controls. So the regular language is very easy to use and you can contribute more controls using that. For image scanning and vulnerability scanning, we are using Anchor. Um, the other question is, I see that you have your own um, task. Yes. Uh, are you going to release, uh, like, we, uh, somebody can run this task in uh, its own cloud? Yes. The, the, this is a very good question. As I said, it's currently not available, and uh, we are expanding the level of open source and what we are going to release to open source. So there is going to be an option to basically download Cubescape in its entirety and, and run it uh, in your own cluster as an open source. Um, it's and probably six months. Last or so. question: Are you going to uh, create an admission controller for? Yes. Okay. The, the, the short answer is yes, okay. uh, because so 
we as an as an open source project and, and and not just an open source every company and every project whatever needs to be fed by user requirements and user demands right so what you just said admission controller is maybe at the top the top two or top three of requests that we keep getting and it's definitely going to be there in like two months or so thank you any more questions Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation and for the tool. It seems quite cool. I would just like to know how exactly does it scan? For example, does it scan only the container or is it also able to scan diamond set, custom resource definition, and what are exactly the limits of the scanning of the tool? Yes. Um, so first of all, the way it scans, it's, it's important. You can deploy the tool in two different ways. Actually, let me show it to you. Um, So when you decide to deploy the tool, you can decide whether you want to deploy it as a CLI. That's what I showed you. Basically, download an external tool. If you download the external tool, it will be limited by what we have the capabilities to do via the Cube, uh, the Cube CTL, basically, right? So Cube API, we read all of the configuration, and that's what it's limited for. Uh, but you can also deploy it as a cluster, as a namespace, basically like an operator in your cluster. And then it will scan also the nodes themselves. It will look at daemon sets. It will look at the control plane. So we actually have different tests that are defined for the control plane and for specific control planes like GKE, AKS, and EKS. Um, we do not do, at this point, CRDs. Uh, the reason we do not do CRDs, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to understand what's a misconfiguration in a CRD because it's custom by definition, right? Um, but we are thinking and we are looking for uh, contributors for specific CRDs. So for example, Istio, right? Uh, if you put Istio, uh, it's a CRD, but it's so popular that it might be worth adding tests uh, to it, right? Um, and also there's something that came up from a few users. Uh, we did not implement it yet. We, we don't feel that there is enough traction for that feature. Um, but, there is, but there was some people who talked about uh, um, creating custom controls for CRDs, right? So if I have a CRD and I know what, what needs to be there, um, I can write a control for that. The reality is that so many people use CRDs and they don't know what needs to be there. Like I would say 80% of the CRDs are just downloaded and deployed, right? Without really knowing uh, what's in there. So, so that's the problem there. And was there anything else I forgot? No, I think you okay. answered all. Cool. And just one last question. Yes. Did you run Cubescape on the Cubescape namespace? Yes, I did. I did. And the honest reality, it's terrible. Okay. <laughs> Let me show you. So actually, if you go to uh, the configuration scanning, let's take this cluster as an example. Mm -hmm. So let's look at, um, I don't know, this control, for example. I'm sure we will find our own namespace in here. Here we go. So you see the AMO namespace itself is not an ingress and an ingress block. Now, this is not completely our fault because we can't define network policy on our own. But um, to be very honest, we also have misconfigurations. We continuously uh, strive to fix them. Okay. Um, and the more you look at it, you'll see that we have more, uh, less and less, of course. Okay, thank but, you. But we're not hiding it. <laughs> thank you a lot. Sure. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, thank you everyone for your time. Sure.